Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, prefer short and succinct questions and answers, please. Question one, Alex Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the Chief Inspector of Prisons for Scotland's recent comments regarding HMP shots. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Government welcomes the publication of Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons for Scotland's progress report on HMP shots, uh, which is a follow-up to the full inspection report that was published in June 2013. The Chief Inspector, David Strang, commented on publication that good progress had been made towards achievement of the 51 recommendations that were made in 2013, noting that 31 had been fully achieved in seven, meaningful progress was in evidence and 12 recommendations are to be addressed. I'm satisfied that the report overall is balanced and uh, records that whilst there, uh, uh, there is a need uh, to make sure further progress is made, uh, progress has been made in a number of important areas and overall the prison runs well, is safe and there is evidence of positive relationships between staff and prisoners. Thank you. Alex Ferguson. Uh, grateful to Cabinet Secretary for that response, but as I'm sure he's aware, one of the more serious aspects that was identified is that there's a lack of meaningful and productive work for prisoners. Um, can I ask him, therefore, if he accepts that the provision of meaningful and productive work is essential to the well-being and rehabilitation of prisoners? And if he does, can he tell me what steps the government and the Scottish Prison Service are taking to improve this aspect of rehabilitation at HMP shots and indeed elsewhere? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so the member may raise a, uh, a good point because this was one of the key areas that was identified by the Chief Inspector of Prisons that requires further action. Um, there is progress being made uh, with regards to the work that's undergoing or uh, the work that's been taken for within shots at the present time in order to make sure there is uh, greater provision of purposeful activity. But overall, uh, the Scottish Prison Service have actually carried out a national review of purposeful activity uh, within the prison system. This was commissioned following the results of a, a piece of work that was undertaken by this Parliament's Justice Committee uh, back in 2013. Uh, we expect that the uh, findings of this to be taken forward uh, by the SPS. There were some, uh, from the review, there were some 131 recommendations in order to improve purposeful activity within the prison estate within Scotland and that the Scottish Prison Service are now developing an implementation plan uh, to make sure they take forward these recommendations to improve purposeful activity within our prison estate. Many thanks. Uh, question two in the name of Mary Fee has not been lodged. An explanation has been provided which appears to be less than satisfactory. Question three, Adam Ingram. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the proposals in the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Bill will help deter trafficking through airports. Cabinet Secretary Michael Mass. Our bill aims to clarify and strengthen the criminal law by introducing a new single human trafficking offence and by increasing the maximum penalty to life imprisonment. The bill will give Scotland's law enforcement agencies greater tools in their armoury to bring those responsible for the misery of human trafficking to justice, as well as guaranteeing support for victims. The bill includes provision for courts to impo impose new preventative orders, restrict the activity of people convicted or suspected of human trafficking offences, including control on foreign travel. There are specific proposals within the bill that will allow for the detention of property, including aircraft, owned or possessed by persons arrested on suspicion of a trafficking offence. The Lord Advocate's recent summit and communique on human trafficking acknowledged the need for cooperation between law enforcement agencies across the UK in response to this crime. And alongside our bill, we will continue to engage with the UK Government, UK Border Force and other relevant UK bodies to share intelligence and to disrupt and deter traffickers who seek to cross our borders. Thank you. Adam Ingram. I thank the Minister for the extensive answer. And the bill is very welcome indeed and will help give my constituents the reassurance that we won't tolerate the use of our airports for this heinous crime. The bill will require the creation of a Scottish anti-human trafficking strategy. So how does the government intend to work with the airports in drafting this strategy 
to ensure they are doing all they can to prevent human trafficking. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, the member raises a, an important point because alongside uh, improvements to the criminal law uh, and strengthening the rights of uh, uh, victims, the bill will provide a commitment for uh, Scottish Government ministers to engage with uh, relevant stakeholders in order to bring forward a trafficking and exploitation strategy uh, for Scotland. What I can assure the member of uh, is this government's intention to make sure that in developing that strategy, we will engage with organisations, including uh, frontline staff, uh, including those at our airports and ports, uh, to make sure uh, that they have an opportunity to have an input into the development of this strategy, but also to make sure that the strategy is framed in such a way as that it helps to support them as frontline uh, staff to make sure that they have the skills and the knowledge necessary in order to make sure that they can identify uh, the signs of potential trafficking uh, and to stop traffickers from being able to bring people across our borders. Thank you very much. Question four, Gil Patterson. Uh, thanks very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the length of custodial sentences for handling of uh, for offensive weapons has changed during the last 10 years. The average length of custodial sentence for carrying an offensive weapon has increased for, uh, for, uh, for 10 years in a row and is now over three times higher than a decade ago. Figures show that the average length of custodial sentence has increased from 111 days in 2004-05 to 374 days in 2013-14. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and welcome these figures. Whilst, uh, whilst there has been significant progress in regard to how, uh, how will the sorry in, in this regard, how will the national rollout of the No Knives uh, Better Lives programme ensure we continue to reduce the number of people who carry offensive weapons? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, there are uh, two key aspects to the approach that the Scottish Government has taken in helping to reduce the number of uh, offences involved carrying an offensive weapon, part of which is, first part of which is education and diversion to uh, educate young people uh, around the risks of carrying a weapon and also to encourage them into diversion programmes as well uh, in order to move them away uh, from any activity that is involved in carrying uh, offensive weapons. And the second part of our approach to this has also been about taking forward robust measures within our criminal justice system, making sure that we use the law effectively to take robust uh, criminal act action against anyone who is found to be carrying uh, an offensive uh, weapon. Alongside that, we have also been funding the uh, No Knives uh, Better Lives programme, uh, which over the last five years we have provided some £2.5 million to. Uh, this is now available across all local authority areas in uh, Scotland as, uh, as of April last year. It is a programme uh, which is based at YouthLink Scotland uh, and it is uh, based on a, a system which targets young people uh, in order to make sure that those who live in communities where there is the greatest effect often experienced of uh, knife crime are actually offered the opportunity to participate in this particular uh, programme. It is a programme uh, which is also based upon being invited in by local authorities in Scotland to allow uh, YouthLink Scotland to roll out the programme within their own local area. And I would certainly want to encourage all local authorities in Scotland to look at the work that YouthLink are undertaking in this particular field and to involve them in the local crime prevention strategies because the No Lives, Better Lives programme is a very worthwhile one and one which demonstrates that it can make a real difference in communities. Thanks so much. Question five, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to provide an appropriate legal process for resolving domestic abuse cases in South Scotland. Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to tackling the scourge of domestic violence, which includes consideration of a new specific domestic abuse offence. Whilst overall levels of recorded crime have fallen in recent years, the reporting and prosecution of certain categories of crime, including domestic abuse, have increased. This may be due to victims feeling more confident in reporting these crimes, knowing that our law enforcement agencies will robustly investigate reports and prosecute where sufficient evidence exists. This is good news as it means more victims are able to access justice. 
In November, the Scottish Government provided new funding of £1.47 million to help justice agencies deal with the efficient progressing of summary court cases, including the increasing number of domestic abuse cases being heard in court. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and I welcome the possibility of the domestic abuse offence um, later in, in this Parliament. Um, in view of the unpalpable history of domestic abuse cases in South Scotland and given specifically the extent of court closures and centralisation, what is the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government doing to ensure that early intervention from the courts with a view to protecting victims uh, is happening still and what plans and funding are being put in place to deal with their needs? Cabinet Secretary. So in relation to uh, uh, domestic uh, abuse cases, um, it's very clear that from our Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service that uh, taking forward uh, cases of uh, domestic abuse are seen as a priority and they have procedures in place uh, for dealing with that. There has also been a range of training programmes put in place for uh, our Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal uh, staff, including uh, cases being considered by uh, senior members of staff in making any decisions about whether they are preceded and taken to court or uh, not once they have completed uh, an extensive training programme around domestic abuse. We also uh, have in place a range of measures which are about helping to make sure that vulnerable witnesses also get the right type of support when they are appearing in court as well. And one of the benefits that will be gained from some of the court changes which are also taking place is that, for example, in Edinburgh, uh, where more of these cases will actually be heard, there are actually dedicated victim and witnesses facilities there, particularly for those who are vulnerable, which we don't have in some of our smaller uh, court places as uh, well. So we have a range of measures which we'll put in place in terms of our Crown Office and Prosecution Services, but also within our court setting as well, to make sure that the right supports are there for victims and that they get the right support and assistance when they may be appearing in court as well. And the member will also be aware that one of the other aspects that the Scottish Court Service has taken forward is the opportunity for uh, video links to be established in those other remote uh, courts to be used as a way of actually giving evidence rather than a witness having to travel into a central point for giving evidence, which again can benefit those who may be vulnerable in situations where domestic violence happens to be part of the case. Many thanks. Uh, question six in the name of Claire Adamson has been withdrawn and a satisfactory explanation provided. Question seven, uh, Paul Martin doesn't appear to be in the chamber and the presiding officers would be grateful of a, an early explanation as to why not. Question eight, Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service regarding the reorganisation of control room facilities. Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the Scottish Government has regular meetings with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service uh, where it receives updates on a range of issues, including control rooms. This was one of the issues discussed at my initial meeting with the service before Christmas, and we are meeting again tomorrow. Bye. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. That's excellent timing. Uh, I recently met with FBU representatives and they are seeking reassurance that there will be sufficient staff in place to ensure that the migration to a single control room in the East can be achieved safely and at minimal disruption to the provision of services and to the staff involved. And can I also ask the Minister if he will um, ask questions about that process? There has already been a change in Dumfries, but that's comparatively uh, a small change compared with the change in the East. And can he also ask questions about the support being given to staff um, other than CV writing and interview skills, particularly for those staff who are going to be required to change jobs? Many are concerned about losing their uniform status. So I'd be grateful if the Minister could either answer today or pick up those issues with the FB, with the uh, Fire and Rescue Services when he meets them tomorrow. Thank you. Many thanks, Minister. Um, I'm very happy to take forward those issues and discuss them with uh, SFRS tomorrow and uh, certainly note the, the member's long-standing interest in the issue in regard to Edinburgh. So I'm happy to take forward those issues and keep in touch with the member on them. Excellent. Question nine, Christina McKelvey. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to address human trafficking. The Cabinet Secretary, Michael Mass. Officer, first of all, I would like to recognise uh, uh, Christina McKelvey's long-standing interest in this issue in pursuing matters as one of the co-conveners of the cross-party group on human trafficking within the Scottish uh, Parliament. On the 11th of December 2014, we introduced to Parliament our Human Trafficking and Exploitation Bill. 
If approved by Parliament, the Bill will clarify and strengthen the law to prosecute and disrupt traffickers. The Bill will also strengthen the right of victims, including giving adult victims of trafficking equivalent rights to access immediate support and assistance as child victims already have. The proposal in the Bill builds on the actions uh, being taken, for, uh, taken following the Human Trafficking Summit, which was hosted by the Scottish Government in October 2012. The Lord Advocate, Frank Mulholland, and the Solicitor General, Leslie Thompson, hosted a further Human Trafficking Summit at the Scottish Parliament on the 17th of October 2014, attended by the heads of prosecution services from across the UK and Ireland. It was agreed that prosecutors would work together to share information to help ensure robust and effective prosecutions of those who are engaged in this heinous crime. Can I thank the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, for that answer? And, um, the prosecutors' event, I actually attended that that day, and it was very heartening to see like-minded people in the room. One measure of the bill is the victim support measures. And as the Cabinet Secretary has already mentioned, giving adult victims the same um, assistance as children already have is very, very important. Within the bill also is, and I hope that this will be pressed by the government, a duty to secure that support and assistance, and that assistance should be given as soon as possible. And this assistance should include accommodation, because we find trafficking victims left destitute, day-to-day -day living, medical advice and treatment, language translation, which is becoming ever more difficult if people have to go and give evidence um, to the, the, uh, the Home Office, and interpretation, counselling, repatriation and legal advice. But I'd also like to draw the Cabinet Secretary's um, attention to a campaign by the Refugee Women's Group who are looking at um, how they have to give evidence on some of the horrible things that have happened to them, sometimes in front of their children, and, and whether the Scottish Government could look at that too. But really, what I want to know is how the Cabinet Secretary intends to implement that assistance and to give adults and children of human trafficking the best support they possibly could have. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, I think um, uh, Christian McKelvey has raised uh, an extremely important point. The, the very nature of human trafficking and exploitation is such that very often it's hidden, uh, and that those individuals who have uh, been trafficked or exploited are often reluctant, in any shape or form, to come forward and to uh, get assistance and support. That's why it's a key measure within uh, this uh, piece of legislation to make sure that there is provision around uh, victim support for those who uh, have been uh, trafficked or uh, exploited. Uh, and the number of areas which the member has highlighted are all the key areas which I can see as being extremely important. For example, the issue of accommodation. If the person was being trafficked uh, or exploited, it may be that their accommodation was previously completely dependent upon the person who was controlling uh, their situation. And uh, once they are no longer in that situation, they become uh, much more vulnerable and may not have accommodation. So these are all factors that will need to be uh, considered around the type of support that will be required for these particular victims, given the complexity of this type of uh, crime and the controlling nature of this type of crime uh, and its impact on the individuals uh, concerned. And a key part of the work that we will take forward is part of the national strategy, which the legislation will place a requirement on ministers to take forward and to also regularly review will to be to make sure that we have the right provisions in place to support those victims uh, in an effective way when they are uh, when they uh, come uh, forward. So I think the member has raised a number of important points, all of which I'm more than happy to consider as we take forward the legislation and also as we start to take forward the development of the uh, national strategy in, the, uh, in this area. Many thanks. Question 10, Dr Elaine Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when Stage 2 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill will commence. Secretary. Uh, Lord Bonamy is expected to complete his post uh, corroboration safeguard review by April uh, this year. Uh, the timing of the Stage 2 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill is a matter for the Parliament, uh, but the Scottish Government would not anticipate Stage 2 commencing until there has been an opportunity to consider Lord Bonamy's recommendations. Dr Murray. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. Uh, I wonder, given uh, the controversial nature of the discussions around the abolition of the requirement for corroboration, whether the Government has any proposals for further public consultation arising from uh, the results of Lord Bonamy's review before Stage 2 actually takes place? 
Ms Hecht. Well, I think it's important, uh, first of all, is that we await to receive the report from uh, Lord Bonamy and their consideration and to then uh, look at the issues which uh, the Lord Bonamy and his uh, group have brought forward. Uh, depending on what's uh, contained within that report will uh, then uh, be reflected in the response that the government then makes about uh, the need for any further uh, uh, consultation. But I think at this stage it's important that we allow uh, Lord Bonamy and the group to complete their work, uh, await the outcome from the report, and at that point we will consider that in detail uh, and will respond in due course as to what we see as being the most appropriate way forward, uh, dependent upon uh, the recommendations contained within the report. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions to the Justice and Law Officers. We now move to portfolio questions for Rural Affairs, Food and the Environment. And I'll give the Minister a moment to take her seat. Mr Henry, if you would like to start with question one, please. Okay. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it will take to prevent waste recycling plants being located next to residential areas or town centres. Minister Aileen uh, This is a matter for uh, planning authorities. Local development plans should identify appropriate locations for new infrastructure and decisions on planning applications should protect residential immunity. Hugh Henry. Uh, thank you, President Officer. It's a slightly disappointing answer. Two years ago this month, there was a major fire at the waste recycling plant in Johnston in my constituency. It resulted in the turnout of one of the highest number of fire service personnel that had been seen in the west of Scotland for many years. Thankfully, because of the prevailing wind, it did little damage to adjacent houses or to Johnson Town Centre, but it did result in the main railway line to Ayrshire being closed for a number of hours. Now, I realise that there is little that can be done in terms of retrospective legislation. But frankly, presiding officer, I don't think it's acceptable to say that it's a matter for the local authorities to use their existing powers. What I'm asking the minister to do is to ask what the Scottish Government will do using its powers to legislate and to set regulations, to change the regulations and to change the rules to prevent in future such plants not being located next to either town centres or residential areas. Minister. Uh, can I thank the member uh, for that? Obviously, as a member, I uh, will also appreciate that I uh, am not the minister uh, for planning. But what I can say in relation to that is that when it comes to Scottish planning policy on the location of waste facilities, that the local development plans uh, should safeguard existing waste management installations and ensure that the new development does not optimise those established waste handling operations, which may operate 24 hours a day and partly outside uh, buildings. Now, in terms of SEPA, uh, SEPA actually regulates the waste facilities through either a licence under the Waste Management Scotland Licensing Regulations 2011 or a permit that's issued under the Pollution Prevention and Control Scotland Regulations 2012 and under Section 36.2 of the 1990 Act, SEPA cannot issue a waste management licence for land which does not have planning permission for that use. And obviously the licence and PPC permit conditions relate to the management and control systems for the activities that are carried out and the precautions to be taken, for example, the type of waste that's accepted, the storage and the treatment processes. And these conditions must be complied with or SIPA will have to take the appropriate enforcement action. Thank you very much. Question two, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to improve air quality in the central Scotland region. Minister Aileen MacLeod. Uh, local authorities have the lead responsibility in assessing and promoting air quality. The Scottish Government has supported a number of councils across central Scotland in providing practical 
and financial assistance in implementing their action plans, continuing to operate a comprehensive network of around 90 air quality monitoring stations and utilising the data to develop and inform policy initiatives. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Minister for her reply? Most of the councils in my region publish the data regarding air quality on a regular basis and in fact have issued this on their website. Will the Minister encourage all councils to publish all air quality information, standardise the data supplied to members of the public in a format which conveys the information in a more understandable manner and can be easily accessed on individual council websites? Minister. I agree that uh, the clear information needs to be uh, available to the public to uh, inform them as to local air quality. And for that reason, in 2007, we established the Scottish Air Quality uh, website and database. Now, that website also allows uh, members of the public to obtain alerts when high pollution episodes are forecast. And through the forthcoming uh, low emission strategy consultation, we will be seeking views on potential improvements that can be made to the consistency and clarity of communications regarding the air quality, reflecting the potential number of pollutants that might be involved. Many thanks. Margaret McCulloch. Thank you, President Officer. It's been over a year since Friends of the Earth Scotland revealed that 14 of the country's top 20 pollution hot hotspots for nitrogen dioxide were breaking EU safety limits, including the Wraith Interchange in central Scotland. Would the Scottish Government agree that to achieve sustainable improvements in air quality, they not only have to complete the redevelopment of the Wraith Interchange to avoid bottlenecks, but they also have to improve public transport in the region overall, with electrification of Lanarkshire railways and, where necessary, better regulation of local bus services? Minister. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we are committed as a government to improving air quality across the country. Uh, we have seen significant reductions in pollution emissions over recent decades through tighter industrial regulation, improved fuel quality, cleaner vehicles and an increased focus on sustainable transport. We are meeting both domestic and European air quality targets across most of Scotland, although they are still localised hotspots of poorer air quality in a number of urban areas. But Scotland's national transport strategy includes, amongst its three strategic outcomes, a commitment to improving air quality. So initiatives such as the Green Bus Fund and the Plug-in Vehicles Roadmap are making a major contribution to improving air quality. Thanks. Question three, James Dornan. To ask, the Scottish Government, to ask the Scottish Government what impact the introduction of charges for single-use carrier bags has had on the number of carrier bags becoming litter or landfilled waste. Minister. Uh, as expected, uh, early reports from some major retailers indicate reductions in bag use of up to 90% since the introduction of the charge. And it is encouraging to see that so many shoppers are now in the habit of reusing bags and we expect that these uh, positive early indications uh, will lead to a visible reduction in bag litter on our streets and beaches. Thank you. James Dornan. I thank the Minister for that answer. I have received a lot of positive feedback from my constituents about the impact of the carrier bag charge and how it has helped make them more aware of the difference simple actions can make to the environment. Can the Minister tell me if the introduction of the charge has been as widely welcomed among shoppers in other parts of Scotland? Minister. Well, a poll following the introduction of the charge showed that 85 per cent uh, agreeing that it is a positive step and only 9 per cent disagreeing, and that is backed up by comments in the media and online indicating that uh, most people have welcomed this important litter reduction measure and adapted well to it. Many thanks. Question four, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government when it will publish the final version of Scotland's National Marine Plan. Minister. The uh, National Marine Plan was laid before the Scottish Parliament on the 11th of December 2014. The plan will be adopted and published following uh, parliamentary scrutiny in accordance with Schedule 1 of the Marine Scotland Act 2010. Mr Beattie. 
As the Minister may know, the popular fisher of sands in Musselburgh are in my constituency. Can the Minister confirm what plans there are to enhance beach usage in a recreational context and what will be done to ensure clean beaches and acceptable water quality? Minister. Uh, the National Marine Plan sets out uh, objectives and policies to support sustainable growth of marine recreation and tourism in Scotland, which includes uh, recreational beach activities. Now, these policies also ensure consideration of development impacts on the sector, and it sets out the requirements to support growth. Now, this includes the protection and improvement of access, infrastructure and facilities, in addition to protection and enhancement of the unique natural resources which the sector rely upon. Now, the general policies of the plan also ensure that measures to address uh, marine litter must be taken which support Scotland's marine litter strategy and activity must not result in the deterioration of the water quality which the uh, Water Framework Directive and other related directives apply. Thank you very much. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I ask the Minister, how will data be collected, collated and coordinated for the National Marine Plan Interactive in an ongoing way uh, from the range of sectors? And how will it be shared, importantly, with the regional marine planners? And I do appreciate that um, the Cabinet Secretary isn't here today, so if um, the Minister wants to respond um, later, I, I would respect that. Minister. Uh, thank you for that. I think given the level of detail that the member has asked for and given that this is also in the uh, portfolio of the uh, Cabinet Secretary, and I'm sure the member will appreciate if I say to her if she was possible to be able to write to the Cabinet Secretary and we will be able to give you a more detailed response to your question. Thank you very much. Alex Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I just ask the Minister if she's able to confirm? I appreciate that the plan was laid before Parliament in December. But can I ask her to confirm that it is still open to alteration, given the fact that the Cabinet Secretary is becoming for the Rural Affairs Committee next week and that the Rural Affairs Committee still has to report its findings to the National Marine Plan? Can she confirm that the plan is still open to alteration and reconsideration, if necessary? Minister. Um, can I also just, thank you very much, President Officer. Can I also say to the member, but that's something that we were very happy to come back to you on when we have further information. Thank you very much. Question five, Dennis Roberts. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the outcomes on the recent climate uh, change conference, which was held in Lima. Minister. The uh, Lima call for climate action has kept the international negotiations uh, moving forward, although with very important issues, principally the overall level of global ambition yet to be resolved. Now, Scotland's messages about the need for high ambition and for climate justice will continue to be highly relevant in the crucial year ahead if the new climate treaty in Paris in 2015 is to stand a good chance of limiting global temperature rise to no more than two degrees Celsius, as the international community has already agreed to do. Thank you. Dennis Roberts. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer? And uh, can I also welcome the Minister, which I think is to her first portfolio of questions in the Chamber. Um, Scotland leads the way uh, in the international community in its ambitious climate change. Can the Minister give us some assurance that the Government remains committed to achieving its, uh, its targets as, uh, and will be an example to the rest of the world? Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Government remains uh, extremely committed and as set out in our programme for Government uh, in November, the Scottish Government will continue to lead work to support the delivery and achievement of our world-leading Scottish climate change targets. Now, the Cabinet Subcommittee on Climate Change, which has been established and will ensure that climate change policy is given the highest priority across all government objectives and the Cabinet Subcommittee on Climate Change will be meeting again tomorrow. Thank you. Sarah Boyack. Can I also welcome the Minister to her new post and can I ask what new initiatives she will be launching over the next 12 months, given that although we are very proud of our targets in Scotland, we've failed, the Scottish Government failed to meet them uh, the first three 
targets year on year. And it's important that we don't just talk the talk, but that we walk the walk. So can you tell us what new initiatives you'll be bringing forward and whether any of those will require cross-party support? Um, just before Christmas, the First Minister said that the opposition parties weren't supportive enough. Well, if we know what the policies are that you're bringing forward, let's talk about them. Minister. Uh, thank you for that. Can I just make the point to the member uh, that, as I said in my previous answer, that the Cabinet Subcommittee on Climate Change is actually meeting uh, tomorrow to discuss a whole range of issues around climate change within the government. Now, we are taking a number of steps to ensure that Scotland remains on track to meet its climate change ambitions. And it is our intention that the report on proposals and policies, the RPP2, will be delivered in full. And where policies and proposals are not being delivered, we will look to bring forward new policies with the same, if not greater, level of emissions abatement. Now, preparatory work has already commenced on the production of the next RPP, which is due for publication in 2016, and we aim to lay the next RPP as soon as reasonably practical. Now, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy has also agreed to fund a new macroeconomic model to help in the preparation of the RPP3. Thanks. Question six, Kenny Gibson. Uh, to, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making towards implementing the Clyde 2020 proposals. Minister. Uh, following the uh, Clyde 2020 summit in April last year, uh, Marine Scotland, with the support from the Firth of Clyde Forum, have been continuing to engage with those stakeholders who have an interest in the Clyde. Now, the outputs of those discussions will form the basis of the Clyde 2020 Action Plan and the governance arrangements which are currently being developed. And this Action Plan will help to better coordinate existing work and it will underpin action to contribute to a better and healthier Clyde. And we are working towards the publication of the Action Plan earlier uh, this year. Mr Gibson. I thank the Minister for that answer and I welcome both the Clyde 2020 process and the Southern MPAs in my constituency. Uh, last April, when Parliament debated Scotland's inshore fisheries, uh, members from across the Chamber sought a regulating order for the Clyde as proposed by the Sustainable Inshore Fisheries Trust to boost the Clyde's environment and economy and help meet Clyde 2020 targets. At that time, the Cabinet Secretary said he was looking forward to receiving an application for this regulating order, which I understand will be lodged this quarter. Can the Minister say where the Government supports use of such regulating orders to deliver local control over fisheries in general or only in specific circumstances? Minister. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government is aware that the Sustainable Inshore Fisheries Trust is currently consulting uh, locally on plans for a regulating order in the Clyde. Now, we're not aware of their detailed plans and we've not yet received an application and when and if received, Marine Scotland will undertake a consultation and assessment uh, of the application before any decision is made on whether to support the application. Now, regulating orders are also subject to parliamentary approval, and they are but one mechanism available to manage our inshore fisheries in Scotland. Thank you. Question seven, Liz Smith. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the flooding infrastructure in Perth and Kinross. Mr. Uh, thank you, Senior Officer. In 2007, all the existing flood defences in Scotland were assessed as part of the establishment of the Scottish Government's flood defence uh, asset database. Now, since then, a new national flood risk assessment has been undertaken by the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, the outputs from which were approved by ministers on the 22nd of December 2011. Now, the National Flood Risk Assessment pulls together all the latest information relating to the sources and impacts of flooding, and for the first time ever, we have a national picture of flood risk across Scotland. And this is a major step forward in our understanding of flood risk, and it is a key milestone towards Scotland being able to target efforts to plan and invest in reducing impacts in areas that are most vulnerable to flooding. And ultimately, this will help Scotland become more resilient to the impacts of flooding. Ms Smith. Uh, the Minister will be very aware that in 2012 uh, the water of Rukula and Comrie uh, flooded very badly, causing thousands of pounds of damage and people to be uh, homeless for that period. And she will also be aware of the audit report that said uh, that Perth and Kinross would check these uh, 
flood situations on a monthly basis, but for the three years previous, it was found that it was only on a yearly uh, situation. Now, that's simply not good enough. Could I ask what information the Scottish Government has got from local authorities about ensuring that these flood-prone areas are actually checked on a very regular basis? Minister, briefly. Can I uh, thank the member for uh, her question? And to also um, just to say, too, that in terms of flood protection schemes, obviously they are primarily a matter for uh, local authorities. And I understand you know, the residents' uh, frustrations about the time it has taken to implement measures to uh, protect Comrie from future flooding. And, however, it's also important to ensure that we've got the right measures are put in place. And this can take time. And I know that Perth and Kinross Council did receive funding for a scheme at Almond Bank during the last round of funding applications, but they weren't in a position to apply for funding for Comrie as they didn't have an approved scheme with all the appropriate statutory consents in place. Now, the Council is investigating the options for a flood protection scheme for Comrie, but I understand that this is in very early stages <clears throat> and the implementation of any scheme may be a number uh, of years away. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions. And we now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 1198.